Okay. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, so, uh, so hello, I'm Simon Mocker. I'm going to introduce Ben. I, I apologize for being a virtual person. Um, so, uh, but, but I'll, I'll try and keep the introduction brief. So, uh, Ben, uh, um, has a bachelor's degree in physics from Brown university, I think, is that right, Ben? And, um, a PhD from Cornell, and after graduating with a PhD from Cornell, uh, Ben went to Princeton to be a Lewis uh, Siegler Fellow, uh, and um, then then Ben came to Yale in uh, in 2018, I think. And um, on reflection, it seems both that that was just yesterday. But it also seems that Ben has been here for a long time, so I don't know really what that means. Um, in any case, uh, Ben Ben is a, a very is somebody who has very very broad interests and has made important contributions in a number of different areas of biological physics, including um, uh, cellular information processing, uh, including um, non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Uh, and uh, including uh, uh, membrane phase transitions, phase transitions both in membranes and, and near to membranes. And I think he's going to tell us something uh, about something related to that today. Um, and I have to look up the title of the talk. It is um, Critical Criticality and Dynamical Bifurcations in Cellular Sensing. So over, over to you, Ben. Awesome. Um, okay. Do the Zoom people see my slides? Yep. Okay. Awesome. Um, so I am going to get started then. Uh, let me just get this. Um, okay. So I, I want to start just by um, giving a very uh, broad overview of biophysics and why I'm excited about it. Um, so this is. Um, uh, a cartoon of the inside of a cell, uh, very roughly the scale. And these blobs here, um, a few nanometers across are proteins. So, um, so these are polymers um, whose sequence is, is uh, 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 designed by evolution. Um, they're little molecular machines and, and there's uh, many, many of them very densely packed um, into a cell at a scale where thermodynamics and noise dominates. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and this mess of proteins at the molecular scale um, produces comprehensible behavior. So I'm going to show you a little movie um, uh, uh, from the Berg lab of, of some uh, E. coli that are swimming. So they do this to try and find food. Um, we're not going to go into detail about uh, this behavior, um, but that's just a, a single bacterium. And, and, and you can see that um, even though the things that make it up are very uh, noisy, um, they're single uh, single machines that, that, that really are at the scale of, of thermodynamics, um, uh, the behaviors are quite comprehensible. Um, and, and of course, this is true for much larger animals also that, that at the molecular scale are, are still just as noisy. Um, um, and, and at this larger scale, um, they're maybe still complicated, um, but they don't have the chaos that's there at, at the lower scale. There's some lower dimensional thing going on. Um, so there's a lot of questions um, about these living systems that, that I think are right for physicists. Um, this isn't a comprehensive list, um, but you could ask how it is that comprehensible behavior emerges um, out of these many noisy molecular machines. Um, you could ask what the functions of living systems are. Um, so they've all uh, uh, been selected for, for some reason or another. Um, and you could ask what, what those functions are and try and quantify that um, and ask what constrains them. So what, what physics constrains them from doing better. Um, um, and you could ask how living systems gather and process information that is available, um, but is distributed among many um, individually noisy receptors. Okay, so there's also tools um, that, that physicists have uh, for these, some, some of which are very familiar. So um, from statistical physics, uh, phase transitions seem to be very important in lots of biological systems. Um, there's soft matter and material science. Um, there's also non-equilibrium thermodynamics and information theory. Um, but because biological systems um, uh, do things, um, you also get to ask questions that are a little bit less familiar um, from control theory, optimization, 
um, and really reverse engineering. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to start by giving just a brief overview of, of some of the recent directions in my group. Um, and this is uh, partly uh, just as a broad advertisement so that people here um, know, know the kinds of things we're working on, um, but also to motivate um, the main part of this talk, um, which is quite a recent and uh, seemingly bizarre direction. Um, and this is going to be about the extreme uh, thermal sensitivity of the pit organ. Um, so that's, a, uh, that's the pit organ there that the arrow is pointing to. Um, and I'm going to give uh, a little bit of an overview of the physiology um, and really ecology of the pit organ. Um, I'm going to do a crash course in what a neuron is and, and how they work for the purposes of this talk. Um, talk about the ion channels that are really the stars of the show of how this work. Um, then I'm going to frame this sensing problem um, that the pit organ has to solve um, and give our proposed mechanism um, uh, that, that, that solves it by sitting close to dynamical bifurcation. Um, then I'm going to talk about some further directions, some other systems that are similar, and, and uh, further questions in the reverse engineering of the system. Um, so just to start with some acknowledgments, um, uh, I really want to thank my group, um, uh, many of whom are here. Um, it's, it's really been a pleasure working with them. Um, many people have joined since the pandemic, so it's great that we're all um, getting together now. Um, and, and the talk uh, the main subject uh, that I'm going to be talking about today um, was really done by Isabella, who's, uh, who's also here um, uh, and, and is a postdoc in the group. Um, so, uh, uh, okay, and, and with that, I'll, I'll just jump into a brief overview of our activities. Um, so, uh, uh, one thing that I've been interested in for a long time um, is, is emergent simplicity and, and why it is that from complicated microscopics, you often get simple macroscopic descriptions. Um, and here's an icing model. This is a classic example of this from physics, um, uh, where even if you added more complications at the molecular scale, once you coarse grain it, um, the renormalization group tells you that only two parameters are going to be important and are still going to be visible. Um, and there aren't similar tools to do that for the kinds of systems that you have in biology. Um, but what we showed is that they still have a very similar geometric structure. Um, and they're still characterized by uh, uh, long directions, so, so uh, directions in parameter space um, that are like relevant directions that are important to, to coarse grain behavior, um, and then a hierarchy of simpler directions. Um, and more recently, um, we've been thinking about, um, uh, uh, led by uh, Michael Abbott now, um, thinking about um, uh, statistical tools um, when you can't do this. So um, when you're not able to actually simplify the model, um, ways to use uh, uh, Bayesian priors to make predictions that are unbiased by the large number of parameters. Um, we also spend a lot of time thinking about energetic bounds. Um, so, uh, so this is work that uh, Sam's been leading. Um, and uh, the claim that we're making in this paper is that if I have a system, say a Carnot engine, um, even if I drive it very slowly, there's a minimum energetic cost, um, uh, a cost which you don't get back when you move the system in reverse. Um, uh, so this is very different from the types of bounds that people usually talk about that you, you do get back if you run it in reverse, as long as you go infinitely slowly. Um, I'd love to discuss this bound with people. Um, uh, coming from the other direction, uh, in this uh, very fun uh, collaboration with Mike Morell's group and uh, uh, Danny Sierra, who just went to the University of Chicago, um, uh, we've thought about uh, how to infer how much en entropy is being produced, so how much energy is being used um, uh, from data, which is time asymmetric. Um, more recently, Sam's been thinking about how much energy it takes to send information. Um, so uh, here's an example. Um, I'm going to be talking more about this example, but um, neurons communicate intracellularly, so individual proteins um, uh, using electrical signals. Um, so there's ion channels um, that let currents across the membrane. Um, and that signals to distant ion channels, which have voltage sensors on them. Um, and, and these signals need to compete with, with thermal fluctuations. Um, and and, and uh, by thinking about this carefully, we can calculate how much energy it costs um, to send a bit. Um, and, and this is just one strategy, um, but they can also create particles which diffuse in the membrane or in three dimensions. Um, and uh, by calculating these for these different systems, we can calculate um, which of these strategies is optimal as a function of, of how far the information needs to be sent um, and, and what frequency it needs to be sent at. 
Um, and we can also calculate order of magnitude estimates um, for how much energy it's going to require. Optimal here means uh, least energy cost per bit. Yeah, so, um, you know, should I uh, depolarize the membrane with current or should I just make a molecule that's going to diffuse? Okay, um, in this very exciting collaboration with, with uh, Thierry um, and, and really led by Henry Mattingly and uh, Keita Camino, um, uh, who sadly for us are, are both leaving for independent faculty, uh, uh, independent faculty jobs, um, we've been thinking about um, how to use information theory to constrain performance. Um, so uh, E. coli, uh, a fantastic system that I showed a little video of at the start of this, um, navigate up concentration gradients uh, by performing run and tumble navigation. So if, if they think they're going uphill, they keep going. If they think they're going downhill, they tumble. Um, and they do this by making very noisy measurements of the concentration. Um, and uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the sensory apparatus that does this, um, but you can convince yourself that if they didn't have the sensory apparatus, they could take a random walk, but they couldn't climb a gradient. Um, and, and what we did is we bounded how much information they needed to achieve a certain performance. Um, and then in really um, science fiction-y experiments um, that, uh, uh, that, that Keita uh, and Thierry did, um, they could really bound or, or they could really measure how much information uh, these bacteria actually get from their environment. Um, and, and what we find um, is that the bacteria are actually pretty close to the theoretical bound. Um, so they're not getting a lot of information, but they're using it efficiently. Um, getting closer to the topic that I'm going to be telling you about today, uh, a, a lot of my work uh, was motivated by this really um, astonishing experimental finding um, by uh, my longtime collaborator, Sarah Beach, who uh, was here a few years ago. I think some people met her. Um, and what she showed is that if you take a vesicle um, from uh, certain cells, um, these are uh, uh, rat immune cells actually, um, and isolated these vesicles, um, that they're tuned very close to an icing liquid-liquid uh, critical point. Um, this is uh, really surprising. So boiling water is somewhere here. Um, it's somewhat near uh, biology, somewhat close to that. Um, but it's uh, uh, very different to see the plasma membrane very close to a liquid liquid critical point. Um, and there's a lot of theoretical questions you could ask about this. So what, what does this critical point mean for the function of cells? Um, how, are, how, are, how are these critical points tuned? Um, and just to give a, a, a few of the current directions in this, um, Taylor has been thinking about what happens if you put protein interaction networks um, into a membrane that's close to a critical point. Um, so there's lots of enzymes that carry out their function um, in the membrane, and these can partition into these two low temperature phases. Um, uh, and, and here's just a little visual. Um, you can imagine that the work they would carry out would be very different in this environment than that environment. And indeed, um, the activity of, of of these protein interaction networks changes dramatically um, as you go through the critical point. Um, Anjabe uh, uh, has been thinking a lot about asymmetric membranes. Um, so uh, in symmetric membranes that you can make synthetically, um, uh, the lore is that it's only possible to get two liquid phases to coexist. Um, but in some remarkable experiments from, from Sarah Keller, um, she showed that if you made asymmetric membranes, you could actually get three phase coexistence. Um, uh, uh, that's shown here. Um, and what Anjabe is exploring um, is whether if I have two coupled icing models, um, they predict a tricritical point, and, and indeed they do. Um, and we'd like to tell um, uh, experimentalists to try and look for this um, by making asymmetric membranes and tuning their composition. Um, uh, in the biology world, there's been a lot of excitement recently about three-dimensional phase separation. Um, so uh, this is driven by proteins and RNA. Um, and here you're seeing an example of it. Um, uh, the protein and RNA is held together by uh, weak interactions. Um, uh, and, and there's also examples. So this is uh, a synapse here. This is all membrane. Um, and this little spot that you're seeing here, um, uh, called the postsynaptic density, 
um, is, is very dense with proteins. And it turns out if you extract those, um, they will phase separate. Um, and what we think is going on in these systems um, is that there's a membrane that's close to a critical point. Um, and then there's some polymers in the bulk that have some weak tendency to phase separate, um, uh, connected maybe to polymers that have a preference to one of these two low te temperature phases in the icing model. Um, and, and that together, the phase diagram of this had, has a tendency to pre-wet, um, uh, a two-dimensional transition that includes uh, components from the three-dimensional bulk. Okay. Um, so that's a little overview of, of other things that we're up to. Um, uh oh, oh, ah, good. Not a serious disconnect. Okay, so the, the main project that I'm going to be telling you about um, is is uh, the pit organ. Um, that's this here. Um, this is a pit viper, and and pit vipers are named because of this pit organ, not not because they live in pits. Um, I, I would not have guessed that correctly quite recently. Um, and this pit is a thermal imaging organ. Um, so they use it for hunting at night when they can't see. Um, and, and, and they set up in a spot with a cool background and they wait for warm creatures to cross in front of them and they strike. Um, and uh, if you look inside of this, um, the pit opening, the thing that you're seeing there is the opening of a pinhole camera. Um, uh, uh, thermal radiation from the world impinges on this very thin membrane here. Um, and then if you look inside of that membrane, there's something like 10,000 of these uh, very thin myelinated nerve fibers um, with these little 10 micron nerve endings. Um, and those are gonna be what this talk is about. So how, how those little nerve endings work. Um, and, and, and this together provides this low resolution thermal image. Okay, so I, I'm just gonna, yeah. Of how many pixels there are? Um, very few. Um, so, so there's 7,000 of these nerves. Um, uh, but uh, the, yeah, there's no optics and the opening's pretty big. Um, so, so, so they don't get a good resolution image. Um, you, you could imagine they do super resolution, that they're just looking for one spot. Um, and maybe they can localize that pretty well. Um, uh, but there's certainly not many independent spots on this membrane. Um, so this is a, a little crash course in the neuroscience that you'll need for this talk. Um, so the neuronal membrane that's, that's this here is a capacitor. Um, and, and there's chemical pumps um, that's, that's, that's this here um, that use the chemical energy in ATP. They, they hydrolyze ATP. Um, and use it to pump sodium out of the membrane and potassium or sodium out of the cell and potassium into the cell. Um, and, and this sets up um, uh, concentration gradients. So sodium and, and uh, calcium are high intracellularly, uh, sorry, extracellularly, um, and potassium is high intracellularly. And it also sets up a voltage gradient around 70 millivolts. Um, and the reason they do this um, is not because sodium and calcium are, are uh, toxic per se, um, but this means that the membrane is excitable. Um, so uh, uh, if I open a, a channel that lets sodium currents through, um, this will depolarize the cell membrane because positive current is gonna rush in. Um, and if I open a channel that lets potassium in, um, this will hyperpolarize the cell because potassium will rush out. Um, so this is um, why uh, neurons maintain these gradients um, and they're hugely expensive to maintain. So um, we spend a good fraction of our energy budget maintaining them. Um, and, uh, and the things which carry out the dynamics are ion channels. So um, this is an ion channel. This is actually the ion channel um, that I'll be talking about more. Um, and ion channels mediate these currents. Um, so these pores that you're seeing here will mediate a specific current um, to a specific ion or a particular set of ions. Um, and they can uh, open and close in response to chemical signals, voltage, and, and things like this. Um, they open and close stochastically. Um, if you record out of a single ion channel in the membrane, um, you see traces like this, where the height of this is about a picoamp, um, and the correlation time is a few milliseconds. Um, and the voltage sensitivity can lead to very dramatic and fast dynamics um, because they can signal to each other through voltage. Um, 
And, and most famously of these is the action potential, which looks something like this. Um, when a neuron fires an action potential, um, there's some intrinsic dynamics um, uh, through voltage that leads to a very fast spike in the voltage, followed by an overshoot, and then resetting to, to um, the voltage that they used to have. And this is how neurons communicate with each other. So on longer time scales, what you see is that the membrane stays pretty close to one voltage, um, but then it uh, sends spikes out that, that communicate to other neurons. Okay, so um, uh, this slide has the most uh, uh, detailed biology, um, but it's interesting, um, and so I want to go through it. So, um, so this is a rattlesnake, um, and this is the pit organ here. That's its nose. Um, and, and what uh, Gracheva, Gracheva is here at Yale, uh, Elena Gracheva, um, um, and in this uh, really groundbreaking paper, what they did is they looked at the sequences of, of RNA um, in the nose, uh, in, in neurons that innervate the nose, um, and neurons that innervate the pit organ. Um, so, so these are very similar neurons. Um, and if you plot um, the reads um, uh, in the pit organ, versus the nose, you see that they're, they're pretty similar. So they express very similar proteins um, with this one dramatic outlier, TRPA1, which is four orders of magnitude higher expressed um, in the pit organ than it is in the nose. So, so there's one ion channel, the TRPA1 channel, um, which is four orders of magnitude more expressed there. Um, and if you look in non-pit snakes, um, that doesn't happen. So those there, it looks similar. Um, and uh, for reasons that I'm gonna tell you about in a second, this was really dramatic evidence um, that this is really looking at, 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 at heat. Um, it's really true infrared detection and it's not photochemical the way our vision works. Okay, so what are thermo TRP channels? Um, TRP channels are really the most sensitive uh, single molecules in biology. Um, uh, they got the Nobel prize in physiology this year, their discovery. Um, and here are, are, are a couple of the ones that we uh, express. So TRPV1 um, is a heat sensor. Um, it has a Q10 value of around 10 to 100. Um, these are the, the uh, biologist favored units. Um, this says that if I increase temperature by 10 degrees, um, their activity will increase by a factor of 10 to 100. Um, but this means that it opens over a few degrees Kelvin. Um, it's also activated by capsaicin. Uh, so that's that's why capsaicin feels hot. Um, TRPM8, um, uh, a, a related channel, but this one senses cold. Um, and all of these TRPs are cation channels, so they all mediate a positive current. Um, when they get activated, be it by hot or cold, um, uh, they let positive ions into the cell. Um, they're sensitive to voltage, calcium, and, and lots of other things. Um, and, and actually, uh, a really interesting question, uh, not the subject of this talk, um, the mechanism of their thermal sensitivity is really not well understood. Um, so if, if you took the qualls uh, last fall, you may have gotten one possible explanation for how this could happen. Okay. So TRPA1, uh, the one in pit vipers is especially sensitive. Um, uh, as a curiosity, we have a homologous channel, um, and it's a cold sensor in us. Um, but in, in snakes, it's a hot sensor, um, and it's a little bit more sensitive than, than our hot sensor. Um, if, you, if you write this in Q10, you get a ridiculous number of 10 to the 4, um, which really is a sign that, that this is off the charts, right? Q10 is no longer the right scale for these, um, for these TRP channels. Um, but, but in our units, this would correspond to roughly a three times increase in activity, uh, uh, sorry, in, in sensitivity. Um, so these channels open over roughly a one degree Kelvin change in temperature. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, um, I'm gonna assume that they're sigmoidal with an activation over something like one degree. Okay, so um, just to summarize to here, um, this, this, uh, this pit organ, um, which I'm not pointing to, um, is filled with these channels, um, which are about as sensitive as biological sensors get. Um, but now I'm gonna tell you that they're actually not nearly sensitive enough. Um, so uh, the pit organ can detect something like this mouse at about a meter distance. Um, uh, Elena actually took this picture on a side note. 
Um, and, and if you just do a back of the envelope calculation, um, this suggests that um, the pit membrane should, should heat up by about one millikelvin. Um, uh, so careful experiments uh, suggest that this ability is really in single neurons. Um, and I'm just gonna show you what this looks like. So if you record out of one of these neurons, um, what you see is that they fire action potentials um, spontaneously and erratically. Um, so something like 10 a second. Um, maybe this looks like it's roughly Poisson distributed. Um, uh, and now if you put a warm object in front of it, um, what you see is that this neuron starts firing uh, much more regular um, and much more frequent action potentials. Um, and then if you take the warm object away, um, sort of uh, strikingly, um, the firing stops um, and actually it goes below the level it was beforehand. Um, and you can think about why this sort of has to be that, that they need to sense millikelvin changes in temperature, um, but these are snakes, they're cold blooded. Um, certainly the temperature of this organ fluctuates by much more than millikelvin. Okay, so I, I just wanna really stress this mismatch. So this is a TRP channel. Um, uh, it is sensitive uh, to roughly a one degree Kelvin change in temperature. Um, but to be functional, the pit organ has to be something like a thousand times more sensitive. And somehow this needs to work even down to single uh, neurons. And just to stress this, the cell needs to be able to sense a change in temperature that just changes the likelihood of one of these ion channels opening by 0.1%. Okay. So um, maybe thinking back to uh, uh, the first experimental physics class, um, if a single channel can detect a temperature with an accuracy of one degree Kelvin, um, if you average many channels together, you can do better than this. Um, so if I have N channels and I, I can um, somehow look in and, and read the state out of all of them, um, if they're really independent, um, then the variance should decrease by a factor of N. Um, and if I look at, at the uncertainty of a single measurement, it should go down by a factor of root n. Um, and this suggests that if I had something like a million channels um, and I could somehow look into each of them, um, I would indeed be able to accurately measure um, a change in temperature of about a millikelvin. Okay, another thing you could do is just look at one channel for some period of time. Um, so, uh, so here is a single channel recording. Um, it has a time scale of about five milliseconds. Um, and I could do the same thing. If I, if I observe for a time tau much larger than this opening time, then I'm basically getting tau over tau naught independent measurements, and I could average them in the same way. Um, and, and of course, I can do both of these things. Um, uh, so uh, if I observe for a time tau with N receptors, um, I, I get a factor from each of these things. Um, and uh, what I want to define from this is a rate of information. Uh, uh, which I'm going to call G, uh, which has units of inverse Kelvin squared seconds. Um, and, and, and this is really a rate um, uh, at which precision arrives about the current temperature. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's really a Fisher information rate. Um, and uh, this argument that I've just laid out really places a, a bound on this, an absolute bound on any strategy that I could use to extract the temperature by looking at these channels, right? Um, so any strategy that I'm going to use is going to be bounded by this. Um, and, and now I want to make a point that this bound is actually not discouraging. Um, so 100 milliseconds is maybe the reaction time of one of these snakes. Um, and in that 100 milliseconds, if I plug in numbers, I, I would just need something like 10 to the 5 channels. Um, and actually, it's hard to get numbers on how many of these channels there are. Um, but that's not an outrageous number. Um, it's a large cell, um, and this is reasonable. Um, but still, um, what this talk is about is the mechanism by which this could be read out. Um, so, so this information is there. If you could probe in somehow and read out the state of every channel independently, there would be no problem. Um, but it's unclear uh, how the cell could read this out. And I want to separate this into two separate problems. So first, Somehow the spike timing um, has to contain information from about a million of these channels or at least channel opening events. Um, and, and somehow this information needs to be integrated and amplified into a collective response. Um, so it, it wouldn't be okay um, 
if 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 the firing rate increased by one part in a thousand, right? Somehow, um, at some step, um, this needs the this the small change in the current um, needs to be amplified into an all or none decision. Okay, and and very broadly, the the hypothesis. Um, is that the TRP channels are going to be embedded in a dynamical system that's tuned, tuned very close to a bifurcation. Um, so uh, this is just a very schematic here. There's going to be a control parameter on one axis and an order parameter on the other. Um, and close to the bifurcation, there's going to be a very steep uh, relationship between the two. Um, uh, and, and, and the system is going to take advantage of this diverging susceptibility. Um, and here, um, uh, the TRP mediated current is going to be on the x axis, and the action potential rate is going to be on the y axis. Okay, um, to give an example of the type of bifurcation um, uh, that, that this is going to have, I want to talk about uh, uh, nuclear criticality in a reactor, um, uh, which, which really has a, a very similar setup. Um, and so, uh, the dynamics of this has a very important parameter, R0, uh, which we're all very familiar with now. Um, and this is, uh, in a nuclear reactor, um, the number of decays that each decay triggers. Um, so whenever uh, a uranium atom uh, nucleus decays, um, it's going to trigger, on average, R0 more decays. Um, and now if R0 is less than one, the reactor will fizzle, um, so small uh, fluctuations will, will die out. Um, if R0 is larger than one, um, the reactor will melt down. Um, and actually this reaction has an effective time scale of milliseconds. Um, and, and what this means is that an operating nuclear plant has to average R0 very close to one uh, with tiny fluctuations. Um, and and uh, the way it does that is not by building the system so carefully um, that R0 is exactly one. It's by having control rods that, that control this R0 um, really in the third digit um, with real-time feedback. And I want to make two points that are going to be important for this. So the first is that this isn't really relevant for reactors, um, but if, uh, if for some reason there was a change in R0, um, so a, a sudden change in the laws of physics, um, the reactor would be a very sensitive detector of this. So if, if, if R0 were to change by one part in a thousand, you wouldn't need to directly measure that you can measure the heat coming out of it. Um, and uh, all you need to wait is for a thousand doubling times. Um, and now you'd see an order one change in the amount of heat coming out. Um, and the second point that's important for this is that the feedback signal is easy to come by. So the system doesn't need to be directly probing R0. Um, what it can probe is the heat coming out of the system. Um, and that gives a very sensitive measure of R0 on long time scales. Okay, so I want to introduce our model um, uh, first qualitatively by analogy to this. Um, so in this system, uranium decays trigger more uranium decays um, on some fast time scale. These are slow neutrons, um, uh, but there's a fast time scale for that. Um, the reaction produces heat, and then on a much slower time scale, um, control rods feedback and, and, and bring the system back to its bifurcation. Um, in, in our model, um, TRP channels are going to activate themselves. Um, I'm going to tell you the mechanism through that, but uh, uh, as a hint, it's going to be voltage. Um, uh, they're going to produce action potentials. Um, and then on a much slower time scale, um, the action potentials are going to feed back. Um, we don't have a proposed mechanism for that, but it wouldn't be hard to do. Uh, one possibility is that uh, action potentials will let calcium um, uh, into the cell, uh, which will then regulate other metabolic byproducts that that uh, change TRP activity. OK, um, so to motivate this, this, this feedback mechanism, um, what I've been showing you is plots of the TRP activity um, versus temperature. But another thing you could do is plot the TRP activity. So this is the probability of being open um, versus voltage. Um, and you can see that this is a heat activated channel because at every voltage, um, uh, at 42 degrees Celsius, it's more likely to be open than at 17 degrees. But the other striking thing is that this has extreme voltage sensitivity. Um, and uh, uh, this is the TRPV1 channel, our heat sensor. Um, our cold sensor uh, looks very similar. 
um, except that the hot and cold uh, lines have switched. Um, so actually, the TRP channels have very different voltage uh, uh, temperature sensitivities. Um, they all have very similar voltage sensitivities. Um, and, and so the way I want you to think of a TRP channel for purposes of this talk um, is as a voltage gated channel that can activate itself um, with a V1 half. So the, uh, the voltage at which half will be activated um, that is temperature dependent. Oh yeah, that's millivolts. Yeah, indeed. Uh, not milliseconds. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah. Also not volts. Yes. <laughs> Only slightly less ridiculous. Yes. Okay. So uh, uh, for a detailed model, um, uh, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, effective dynamics for the voltage. Um, there's going to be some intrinsic electrical dynamics, uh, which uh, we're not going to specify that the prefer to bring the voltage back to some equilibrium value um, at a time scale tau v. Um, there's going to be a TRP signal. So I'm going to talk about what this probability of being open is um, and, and, and these other terms. Um, and then there's going to be noise, which comes from, from, from the opening and closing of individual TRP channels. Um, and then in addition to this, um, when voltage reaches a threshold, an action potential is going to be fired and, and the voltage is going to be reset. Um, and, and we're not going to explicitly include those dynamics. Um, and the signal is going to be read out by the time of these action potentials. OK, um, so uh, the first thing I want to explain is that in, in our model, the signal is going to be sigmoidal um, uh, in voltage. Um, uh, so if we look at this red term, the TRP signal, um, uh, this P naught is going to have this form. Um, it's a very good fit to the data. Um, so, so the voltage is sigmoidal um, uh, with a delta V, so a width here um, of about 30 millivolts. Um, um, and, and the other term I need to explain is this V max. Um, and the way to think about it is this is the voltage that the membrane would reach if all of the channels were open. OK. Um, uh, the other term that I need to explain is, is this TRP noise, um, and, and the important factor is this 1 over root n in it, um, and, and the reason it has this form um, is that we've chosen to normalize the dynamics um, uh, such that uh, when all of the channels are open, the current is Vmax, so Vmax is in there, um, and this is really just root n noise, um, and, and, and this is assuming that the channels are acting independently. Um, we could talk about that assumption. Um, and maybe more dramatically, we're ignoring other noise sources. So um, uh, most prominently, there's other channels that, that certainly need to be involved um, to make the action potential, um, but we're not worried about those. So um, to analyze qualitatively these dynamics, um, what we can do is plot um, minus the first line versus the second line, um, and where these cross uh, will be a, a fixed point of the dynamics. Um, uh, and in one regime, um, I'm going to call this the deterministic regime for reasons that I'll explain in a second, um, the distance between the red and the black line is always positive. Um, and uh, uh, to the left of this, um, there's a single fixed point. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so what's going to happen is that the, the, the voltage, if I started anywhere to the left of here, is just going to deterministically go up that as long as I neglect uh, noise here. Um, uh, if I shift V1 half a little bit, then I'll be in this other regime uh, where now there's uh, uh, three fixed points, two stable ones and an unstable fixed point. Um, and and, and um, uh, if we add action potential dynamics to this, um, on the left, uh, this is going to be the deterministic regime. Spikes are going to be regular. Um, so. Uh, uh, when the system resets to here, it's going to deterministically go up and fire another action potential. Um, whereas on this side, uh, when the action potential resets, um, it's going to sit here for a while until noise um, pushes it over the boundary and fires an action potential. Okay, and then in addition to these dynamics, um, uh, we're going to add uh, uh, qualitatively uh, just feedback such that whenever uh, the interspike time is too long, so that, that's a, that implies that it's in the bistable regime, 
uh, B1 half is going to shift to the left. Um, and whenever it's too short, B1 half is going to shift to the right. Um, and and um, this is qualitatively what, what simulations of this look like. Um, so before a change in temperature, there's stochastic spikes. Um, they're irregular. Um, uh, and that's because it's tuned close to the bifurcation, um, but to the left of it. Um, and then uh, uh, when there's a change in temperature, um, that pushes the system through this bifurcation. There's a bunch of, of fast action potentials. Um, and then there's slow adaptation that brings it back um, uh, to a similar state as before. Yeah, uh, sorry. So in, in uh, um, yeah, that, that's this. So, so there's, there's noise included in it, um, uh, not in this analysis, not in this analysis, but in the simulations. Um, and that's, that's what causes spikes in this regime. So there would be no spiking without the noise here. So, so in this regime, um, uh, the spikes, whenever there's an action potential, the, the current resets to here. Um, and so the, the, the spikes are very regular, right? Because even without noise, there will be spikes. So when you add noise, there will be jitter in the spike timing. Um, but, but roughly the spikes will be regular, right? The, the, the amount of time it takes. Um, so so in, in this regime, they spike without noise um, because there's only one fixed point. Um, sorry, so, so, so in this model, um, when you hit the screen line, you fire an action potential and get reset. Um, whereas on this side, um, you'd get stuck here, right? Um, yeah, so, so the, the, the action potentials are not explicit in the equation. Um, okay. Okay, so um, uh, to analyze uh, the sensitivity close to, to the bifurcation, um, uh, uh, what we want to see is that um, for every value of delta V over V max that's less than a quarter, um, there's a critical point for some value of, of, of V one half. So if I shift this line back and forth, at some point, um, this line will cross. Um, that's where this bifurcation is. And we can define the distance to it, so the length of this green line, um, uh, as the distance between V one half and the bifurcation. Um, and away from the bifurcation, um, the time scale is set by one over the, the voltage. So, so maybe with a prefactor. Um, and, and in our model, that's something like 100 hertz. Um, but as you get close to the bifurcation, um, the spike rate, so the rate at which you, you cross this, um, gets very slow. Um, here I'm showing you the deterministic predictions or the, the n goes to infinity predictions. Um, and on this side, there's no spikes. Um, and, and there's square root dependence here. Um, uh, very steep dependence. Um, um, and and uh, uh, OK, so, so to understand what happens with a finite number of channels, um, uh, it's important to understand that near the bifurcation um, and to the left of the bifurcation, noise becomes important. Um, and in fact, from some scaling, the noise dominates um, when n is less than delta v 1 half over delta v um, to the minus 3 halves. Um, so this is, uh, you can see this here, that um, uh, uh, as, as the number of channels increases, um, this gets sharper and sharper. Um, and and, and the, uh, the width in delta V one half that I need to go um, uh, before I leave the deterministic predictions um, gets thinner and thinner. Um, and if we zoom in on this, this region in here, um, and, and, and examine the regime where noise dominates, um, what you can see is that the maximum slope, um, this is going to scale as the one third power of n. Um, uh, so so the, more, uh, the more channels I have, uh, the steeper I can get by getting very close to the bifurcation. Um, and we can define the amplification as the log of the slope um, exactly at the bifurcation. 
uh, or the slope of the log rather. Um, and near the bifurcation, this scales as the two thirds power of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, n is only in in the noise, uh, in the noise term. Uh, so, oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. Psi of t is is a, a, a random noise with delta function correlations. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, so. So this is the the model of the electrical dynamics inside of 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 this neuron. Right. I just want to know what n is the number of of channels. Yeah. In the neuron. In the neuron. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. So. So let me just uh, go back to. I uh, didn't explain this part well. So. Um, so, so this is um, the assumption is that that every channel opening is independent. Um, uh, so this is binomial noise. Um, uh, th this is binomial noise, um, and we're dividing by the the. the um, this is the, there's a Vmax. Uh, there's the same prefactor as this in here. Um, so, so this is fractional noise, and and the fractional noise decreases with n, uh, like root n. Um, um, yeah, I, I suppose I haven't derived that this is binomial noise, um, um, uh, but, but that should have a root n in it, right? Um, um, and, uh, and, and this tau naught is, it comes from the, the, the typical time of opening, right? So the longer that is, uh, the larger the fluctuations will be. You know, I would say that if, if I get a random, uh, five, Open openings of channels, sometimes you have a very big spike because you open many channels, and sometimes not. Yeah. Both spikes are the same as a psi of t. It's a delta function, right? So it goes from 0 to 1. I would say that, that, that this means that, um, so there's, there's a problem if you're interested in time scales shorter than, than the opening time, but longer than that, with many channels, that should give white noise. Uh, which is which is what this assumption is. So, yeah. So, um, so the it's it's not white noise if you look at frequencies of order five milliseconds. But as long as we're not interested in that, um, I think this is a reasonable way to implement uh, the assumption that the channels are independent. <laughs> Large number of anything you'll get the ocean noise. Uh, the yeah, this, so the, this. Um, I, I think this would be Gaussian also. So the the the. Uh, so. If it's mostly open, it's less noise. Yeah, so th this is um, uh, the, the expectation value is, is delta function correlated. Um, uh, but if I look at, at the magnitude of this over, over some finite window, it'll be Gaussian distributed. Awesome. Yeah, so, so the noise has the same amplitude uh, everywhere. Right. Um, uh, uh, sorry. So, uh, sorry, this is. Um, so, so, the, the, so the lines are, are, are the action potentials. So this is the voltage versus time. Um, 
And on, on this side of the transition, it's not firing many action potentials. The only action potentials it does fire is when noise pushes it over. Um, uh, when the temperature is changed, um, that pushes it through the transition. And now even without noise, it will fire action potentials. Um, uh, at a much higher rate for what uh, accommodates the Exactly. Okay, and 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 okay, so maybe this is also getting at your point that that um, this is without any noise. Um, and without any noise, um, to the left of the bifurcation, the system doesn't fire action potentials, right? Um, uh, it's stuck uh, uh, in the left uh, fixed point. Um, and uh, there's a continuous transition or a bifurcation um, uh, to, to firing action potentials on the right of this, um, uh, which is infinitely sharp if you have infinite number of channels. OK, and, and, and the point is that, that this does not entirely hold um, once you have a finite number of channels, um, because if you go a little bit to this side, um, you will fire some action potentials um, uh, that are uh, driven by noise. Um, um, and so that prevents us from getting infinitely sharp. Um, uh, um, and, and, and the noise, in fact, dominates um, um, as long as you're within a factor of, of, of uh, delta V to the minus 3 halves. So when N is less than this, um, noise will dominate. Um, um, so if you, if you examine this regime uh, where, where, where uh, where noise dominates, um, uh, what you can see is that there's a maximum slope. Um, the maximum slope scales like n to the one third. Um, so as I increase the number of, of channels, um, this part right here gets steeper. Um, and the amplification, which is the log slope at the bifurcation, um, uh, th this is what I would call the amplification. This is the, the largest fractional amplification you could get. Um, uh, this scales as n to the two thirds. Okay, so you get a lot of amplification if you sit very close to this bifurcation, and in particular, if you sit close to it um, while having a lot of ion channels. Um, but another question you could ask is, if you look at a spike train, um, how well would you be able to infer temperature? Um, um, and recall, there was this absolute bound on the information rate that you could get um, from single channel noise. Um, and, and here, what we want to ask is, is um, uh, what, what would G be um, the rate of information um, if you couldn't see into every channel, but you could instead just look at the spiking rate. Um, so, so if you could actually just look at, at the rate um, of spikes. Um, and um, so one component of that is how steeply the spike rate varies as I change temperature. Um, and I've argued that, that, or really shown you that, that as you get very close to the transition, um, this gets steeper and steeper. Um, but this comes at a cost. And the other thing that will go into this information rate calculation um, is the scaled spike variance. Um, and this is how stochastic the spikes are. Um, and, um, uh, and I'm showing you this, the variance uh, in spike timing divided by the average spike timing squared. Um, and, and to the left of the bifurcation, um, this goes to one. Um, that's, that's what you'd expect from a Poisson distribution. Um, and that's because these are noise dominated and the system will sit in one of the deep wells um, until it stochastically leaves. Um, and then as you get very far into the deterministic regime, true to its name, um, the scaled variance goes to zero. Um, uh, so this really is the, term, the deterministic regime in the sense that spikes become very regular. Um, and these are going to uh, uh, go against each other. Um, and, and, and I think the way it makes the most sense to display this is in terms of the information fidelity. Um, and this is the fraction of the information that's in the single channels that's still contained in the spike train. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and these are numerical results. So um, in the stochastic regime, um, this goes to zero. So when the neuron is not firing spikes, almost all of the information is lost. Um, but once you go to the de deterministic regime, almost all of the information is preserved. Um, you don't need to be close to the transition. If you can see the spikes uh, to arbitrary precision, um, you can infer the temperature almost as well as if you could look in all of the individual channels. Um, but, yeah. So when you're in the deterministic scheme, it, it 
runs up to the other fixed point. That dynamics you're not describing causes the tax potential to fire at some point. It's like a relaxation oscillator that is causing the That's right. Yeah. So the um, it fires an action potential, and then we don't put the yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so um, uh, most of the information is preserved um, in this regime, but if you want to extract it, you need to be able to measure these really tiny changes um, in spike timing, right? Um, because the variance is very small. The way that this information is preserved um, is, is that the, the, the fluctuations in spike timing are very tiny. And so even a one part in a thousand change in spike timing um, is relevant. Um, so, um, uh, so we can put this in information uh, uh, in an information theory framework um, by, by adding a small bit of, of extra stochasticity that comes maybe from the spiking itself or maybe from your ability to read it out. Um, and so you could instead define the information rate um, that's accessible um, as being the information rate if I replace the variance of the spike timing um, with the variance of the spike timing plus a small fraction of the timing itself. Um, so this prevents you from, from getting an accurate readout just by having the spiking be very regular. Um, and uh, uh, what you should note about this is even with very small readout noise, so say 5%, um, you need to be very close um, to the bifurcation um, to get most of the information out. Um, so, so if there's an inability to read out spike timing to, to say picosecond precision, um, you need to be very close to the bifurcation to be able to get an accurate measurement of temperature um, by looking at the spike train. Okay, um, so uh, I want to make kind of a curious parallel um, to, to, to cutting edge bolometry. Um, uh, this is uh, roughly my recollections of a really fun uh, uh, chat with Laura um, now a few years ago. Um, so, uh, so transition edge sensors are the state of the art for detecting heat. And the basic idea is that the sensor is gonna be a superconducting element that's tuned very close to its superconducting transition. Um, and incident radiation is gonna impinge on this. Um, and and uh, the basic idea is that um, uh, uh, you're going to use the critical point to amplify a weak signal. Um, so here's uh, the resistance um, as a function of temperature, um, very close to the superconducting transition. Um, it, it gets very sharp. Um, and, and now if, if, if you somehow keep your chunk of metal um, very close to this transition, um, you can read out a very small change in temperature um, by seeing how the, resist, the resistance shifts. Okay, um, and, and my understanding is that the um, um, the uh, breakthrough that made this uh, practical um, is to, to bias the circuit based on voltage. Um, and what this does is that when the temperature is too high, um, the resistance is up here. Um, and that means the current is gonna be lower. And so actually less power um, is, is being dropped into the circuit. Um, and so it will cool off. And, and on the other hand, if it's too cold um, at fixed voltage, uh, the current will increase depositing more power um, and so this will tune it always to come back to this uh, uh, chunk right in the center of the critical point. Um, that's a, a, a circuit that will do this. Um, and, and, and this is very parallel to, to, to this circuit that I've described. Um, it's self-tuning itself um, uh, uh, to a very different transition, a superconducting transition, um, but really for very similar reasons to, to amplify the weak signals. Um, so uh, I hope I haven't mauled that. Uh, um, um, uh, but in this scheme, it's the current that reads out um, the temperature. Um, okay, um, I am way behind where I thought I would be. Um, so I'm gonna wrap up here actually. Um, uh, and um, so what, what, I've, uh, what I've told you about is that um, uh, being very close to the critical point or the bifurcation here um, integrates information um, uh, from many channels. Uh, so, so the information is in these channels, um, uh, but it's not accessible. Um, uh, the nature of the bifurcation is that the TRP ion channels are electrically coupled, um, and there's a bifurcation that separates a quiet regime 
um, from a regime where they're uh, uh, firing rapidly. Um, the functional role of this bifurcation is that it, it, it's needed to, to integrate information and amplify it. Um, um, and tuning um, has to somehow come from feeding back the action potential firing rate onto V1 half. Um, and any way that you do this will naturally tune it um, to a bifurcation. Um, and I, uh, well, uh, let me just advertise that, that uh, there are other systems that seem like they work uh, a bit like this. Um, and I'd be very happy to chat with you um, afterwards um, about chemo reception and hearing. Um, and with that, I will take questions. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so the question is, uh, is it known how um, uh, how uh, V1 half or, or how the, um, the temperature sensitivity is reset when the snake um, heats up, for example? Um, and uh, one thing I would say is that this scheme that, that if you're firing too many action potentials, um, uh, you change V1 half in one direction. And if you're firing too little, um, this should work for that, um, you know, either for the scene getting hotter or colder or for much larger temperature changes that, that the snake has. Um, molecularly, what's happening is not um, well understood, but for other TRP channels, there's actually quite a diversity of, of tuning mechanisms. Um, I think the most common one is that calcium um, uh, uh, regulates the hydrolysis of PIP lipids and PIP lipids bind to the channel um, and regulate how, how easy it is to open the channel. Um, so yeah, so, 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 um, okay, so, so, um, it seems totally impossible to, to regulate this axis, um, but, um, but that's not what they need to do. They, what, what they can do is measure this axis, and because this gets very steep near the transition, um, uh, they can use this signal, so how quickly the action potentials are firing, um, to feed back and regulate the sensitivity of the system. Um, um, so they don't they don't need to measure um, if if that makes sense. Um, um, uh, Sid. Okay, so the temperature sensitivity goes as one over the square root of the number of ion channels. Uh, is that also multiplied by the opening time of the number of ion channels? By averaging the noise, is that how the sensitivity? Yeah, yeah. So um, that is true. Basically, every time that that um, that you saw n, it should be n tau naught. Um, um, so I, I would say n is the more dramatic one, but but that's true. So n, uh, I want to say n tau naught over tau v, um, but that's order one. Um, so in, indeed. If you had a shorter opening time, um, you could get by with less channels because the, the single channel, each each channel would provide a more sensitive measurement. Sorry, which which tau is that? So if, if the opening time of a single channel were shorter, um, uh, uh, you could get by with less channels uh, because each channel would be less noisy, right? Um, I, th I think that's where you're going with your question. Uh, I was thinking that the average time that you, that you have will reduce the, the noise that you get better temperature. Yeah, so the ratio of the measurement time to the single channel time is what's important. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Do you know whether that's something that is totally innate or whether the snakes have to actually do it? Oh, this I don't know. This is a this is an interesting question. Um, yeah, there there. Uh, I don't know much about the behavior. Um, uh, um, I, I know they do this thing where they set up with a cold background so that they have more contrast. Um, you know, I mean, I yeah. Uh, I think Charles. You got it. But how did you uh, read the 
good amount of time Um, um, actually, could you repeat the question? So, <laughs> this is uh, in the um, th this is in the absolute bound or in the Oh, uh, yes, sorry. So, so um, Isabella, you should correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so the question is, um, uh, the question is, uh, I think as a practical matter, um, how do you go from here to here? So how, um, how do you incorporate readout noise um, in, in the information rate? Um, uh, uh, and the idea is to replace this. Uh, say point one. So, uh, so the idea is that in addition to some intrinsic variance um, um, in the spike timing. Um, the, the readout itself has some noise which is proportional to the average spike time. Um, so, for the temperature of something voltage. Um, so there's uh, um, uh, there's many parts to this question that I don't have good answers to. One is um, how broad a range does the snake, um, uh, you know, how broad a range does it need to adapt to? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but it, it's it's certainly much more than millikelvin. So they need to be able to adjust this over a pretty large range. Um, uh, was that was that your main question? Uh, Ah, so yeah, so um, so uh, so I, I have not seen this exact plot for the the snake channel, um, but the, for trip A one, yeah, um, uh, cer certainly people look at it at different temperatures, but I don't. Um, I don't swear that it doesn't exist, but I haven't seen it. Um, uh, I, I don't know the range of temperature over which you get curves that roughly look like this, but shifted. Um, I don't know if these are kind of the ends of it. Um, yeah. Um, um, but th this wouldn't be discouraging, right? A snake that could go from 17 to 42 Celsius, that's, that's a pretty big range. All right, why don't we thank Ben again? Thanks. Ah, thank you. Okay.